red concave impactors can recall a project that we did for TxDOT on a highway in East Texas that had red concaved woodpeckers around it. And so we looked very hard at where TxDOT wanted to take additional right away and where were the red concaved woodpeckers. They're, they're a colonial nester. They kind of uh, nest in, in clusters. And then there's habitat around it that we can see as foraging habitat, all these kinds of things we all factored all that into our analysis of how much they were taking. But that analysis didn't really factor in those kinds of secondary effects, such as widening or improving this road is going to allow additional development that might then take red cockaded woodpeckers. Um, It was just a very exhaustive analysis of those kinds of primary impacts or or direct effects of the roadway improvements on red cockaded woodpeckers that, uh, I mean, it it, it covered that really well, but didn't really look at secondary impacts. I think the only way we're ever really going to get to um, a good consideration of secondary impacts is would have to be a little bit more of um, a kind of a fundamental change in how we protect habitat in Texas. I wish that we could get to a point where we would have a better funding source, for example. Um, there are a number of other states, and I, I looked at this once and found like 36 other states that had some kind of a funding mechanism for land conservation that was based on real estate transfers. And so it's been talked about here, but not in a long time, not seriously, where if if a land transfer just generated a small fee, like $100 or whatever, with all of the land transfers and uh, land deals that are done in Texas, that would raise just millions of dollars every year that could be used for land conservation. But what's really happening is it's not just, oh, there's this highway that they widened by, you know, adding five feet of shoulder and that caused new land development down the street. You know, we have to be able to look and see like what's happening on a broader level with land use in Texas and how do we find a way for that to pay for the habitat loss the other states have done this you know like I said there there's a bunch of them and they have set up a funding mechanism to allow the state government and local governments you know, to use funding that's based on real estate transfers Maybe that's what we need here, you know, because we're trying to say, well, if you're taking endangered species and if you have an HCP approved and if that's done by a local government that is buying all their preserved land as they go and not identifying things up front, you know, all of these if, 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 then it's okay. But, you know, I think we need to look at things a little bit more comprehensively and say, you know, Texas is primarily a private land state and that's okay. But we can work with the private landowners that want to protect their land the way it is so that they don't have the the economic pressure to sell it and maybe can keep it protected for the next generation if they had a little bit of help protecting habitat that really does benefit us all. And there are a lot of landowners out there that, you know, yeah, sure, they'd like to be able to protect their habitat, but, you know, they've got to think about their future and their kids' future too. And if they just had a little bit more help on protecting the land, they may be more interested in doing it. So I think we just need to look at some other, other tools that can be used here that they do use successfully in other states. That's, I think, how we may be able to get to those kinds of secondary impacts, not just by on a project by project basis. I hope that's clear. 